Welcome to the, the session on solving real-time IoT challenges. Um, and for those of you watching this on the live stream, thanks for watching it. Um, today, what I would like to do is to kind of share the journey that we have undertaken at Verizon Labs in solving problems associated with developing and deploying IoT applications and help you with some of the challenges that we had with creating our own real-time data pipeline and how we utilize Couchbase to solve some of those problems. Um, so the quick agenda, in, so we'll go through introduction in introducing both myself as well as my team and Alex and Rick if they are still here. And as well as how we solve challenges associated with active, active data centers and how we utilize Couchbase to solve some of those challenges. And lessons learned but when we deployed Couchbase in production, as well as talk a little bit about the real-time data pipeline that we put together using Couchbase, Mesos, Docker, and Spark. And we will have a like, kind of a video demo of what we did and running Couchbase at 3.5 million operations per second. And Spark is able to process at around 500K events per second streamed into Kafka and from Kafka into Spark jobs. Uh, just a little introduction about myself. I lead the IoT platform team uh, in Verizon, uh, in, uh, at Verizon Labs. Uh, before Verizon, I worked at Qualcomm and led their IoT platform development team. I spent most of my time creating distributed messaging systems as well as rules engines. So I'm quite interested in this scale out technologies and how we can better utilize them to solve challenges associated with uh, computer science. Um, like I, I would like to introduce my team here who are with me, who helped, who did the hard work in solving a lot of the things that we did on the real-time data pipeline as well as utilizing Couchbase. Um, Abhishek, Yifeng, and Steven, you guys want to stand up? If you guys have really any technical questions, they will be available to answer any of the questions around how we put the pipeline together and how we utilize Couchbase. Alex or and Rick, I'm not sure if you're here. Hey, Alex. Hey, Rick. So they have been helping us quite a bit, and uh, I highly recommend that you talk to them if you're really interested in using Couchbase in, in a production environment. I mean, they're really great, and they have been quite helpful in making sure we are successful. Um, quick introduction, this was covered in the keynote session. I want to just give a quick overview of what we are trying to do with ThinkSpace, um, just a brief uh, introduction. So ThinkSpace is an IoT platform that helps our customers to build, deploy, and manage their IoT solution using services provided by the ThinkSpace platform as well as other solutions available to customers from Verizon. If you really think about an IoT ecosystem, you typically have a device and you have a client on the device that's performing some kind of sensing and collecting data and making some part of the application decision or the, the intelligence. Part of the intelligence could be potentially be on the device, De depending on the real-timeness of the decision that needs to be made, some of those decisions will happen right there on the device. You cannot really wait for the data to be pushed into the cloud and then for the decision to be made. In other cases where the decision can be made later or the delayed decision is possible, the data will be pushed from the device into a cloud. And once the data comes into a cloud, through a connectivity layer, and that's where Verizon's most reliable network can help our customers, is really to make that sensor to be mobile and can be anywhere, anytime, and still be able to take the data from the device and transmit it to a cloud reliably and securely. That's the power of connectivity for IoT. 
Once the devices are onboarded into the ThinkSpace platform, services like connectivity management, device management, reporting and analytics, security and compliance can be made available to, the, to those applications on those devices. And through an API layer, a developer or customers can interact with the ThinkSpace plat platform to take advantage of the services that is provided by us. Those APIs can be utilized by applications that are built by Verizon or by our partners or our customers, and they can then take that application and launch it globally through the carrier network support that Verizon can provide for your global deployment. So that's, in a nutshell, what ThinkSpace platform can help our customers with. Now, this is a good question, why? Why did we utilize Couchbase for our platform? What benefits did we get by using Couchbase? Now, if you really think about it in terms of what we needed, we needed our use cases required that we provide real-time dashboards, reports, notification, and alerts to our customers. And our customers, when they have, when we give them the real-time dashboard, they need a drill down capabilities. And we had to support these capabilities in a highly available environment where we cannot go down, even either for like software upgrades or maintenance or OS patches or data center upgrades, any of those infrastructure issues, we cannot still impact our customers. So when we looked at those requirements and looked at Couchbase, Couchbase gives us predictable performance, horizontal scalability, and a flexible data model that you don't have to go and change the model each time you add new functionality to your application. Or it gives you the cross data center replication functionality that allows you to connect to active, active data centers and be able to utilize them to provide high availability. So these capabilities helped us to put to, together Couchbase as part of our platform so that we can provide the availability and the functionality that is needed for our platform services. So, here are some things that we did. Um, uh, so, kind of rules that we follow in terms of when we deployed Couchbase. Don't tune Couchbase unless you really need to. It works really great out of the box. Couchbase is one of the easiest NoSQL databases to deploy and maintain and scale out compared to other NoSQL solutions we have tried. It is so stable and it's really, I mean, we have been running it in our labs, in our test environment for years and re we really didn't run into ma any major issues. So if you really feel like, okay, you really need to tune it to get the extra few percentages of funk performance, talk to Alex. <laughs> <laughs> And he can tell you really what things our customers went through to get the extra performance. And one thing we, we kind of learned is that every use case is different. And every environment is different. You need to benchmark your workload, your application, yourself to feel comfortable that any solution you put together is going to work for you. So Couchbase is great as a key value store. If you're looking for a key value store, you probably don't even have to think twice before you pick Couchbase and use it. And if you're using queries using Nickel, you want to be making, you want to make sure, is it the right way for you or not? I mean, one, in our experiences, what happened is we used Nickel just like any other search engine, and it probably did not work for us because Nickel was designed for a secondary index lookup, and we were looking for something else. So what I would recommend is that if you're using Couchbase for a specific purpose, benchmark your application workload against your application queries and make sure it works for you. Now here are some of our kind of 
kind of limited testing that we did with Couchbase initially. That kind of gave us the comfort level that Couchbase is good enough for what we needed, and it can go beyond what we needed. So even with a very small cluster of three nodes, it gives us very high throughput in terms of both read and write. And the, the latency numbers are really, really awesome in terms of what you can get from a three node cluster. So going a little bit more into the, some of the challenges that we had to solve in our platform and how we solve them, um, we, the, one of our challenges is, is we provide our customers with a flexible device report. So our customers can go and create HADOC queries that can span 35 fields and they would be essentially sorting on any of those fields, filtering on any of those fields, and paginating through the results set. If you really think about it, like a lot of these things, even though even for a small data set, the traditional SQL engines really cannot provide that functionality because what you really needed is you needed an index. If you really, if you really think in terms of relational model, you needed an index that covers 35 columns in order for it to be optimized. And normal traditional relational databases don't really deal well when your query spans so many columns and you have to do filtering, sorting, and paginating on those, on those result set. So we had to scale the solution to support thousands of enterprise customers and each of those customers have a view into the same data, uh, but they had limited, their view is limited to only the data that they own, or only about the devices that they onboarded into our system. So you, it's kind of, each customer could be coming in and looking at the data set, so it's hard to cache the result set uh, because you don't know when a customer comes in what kind of report they are going to look at, as well as being able to narrow the data set in real time was important to us. Now, another thing that we had to do was, like, we need to be able to add new functionality to our application and quickly bring it to the market. So, it, which meant, like, our data model needs to be flexible. And that is one of the important criteria that we get from Couchbase as well. We needed our application to be always on with active active data centers, and we needed five nines availability for, for our uh, application. So other additional challenges were our growth in the number of IoT devices was growing exponentially. So the traditional systems, while it worked, with a smaller data set, they cannot keep up with the growth in the IoT devices. Um, so the response time with our reportal reports became unpredictable. Sometimes it would work. Sometimes it started slowing down. Sometimes it just wouldn't work for a customer with millions of devices. So because of those and other, other challenges were associated with our stored procedure layer, and essentially, if you really think, um, think in terms of relational layer, databases, your stored procedures become like, okay, you start developing a generic stored procedure, and then what ended up happening is, because of the optimizations we need to perform for each types of query, we started creating like a subsection or a sub stored procedure for each of those queries to optimize, keep optimizing, keep optimizing. Then it just, the, the logic for optimization kept growing, growing, growing. It became unmaintainable after a period of time. And also, in order for us to be able to provide the data that our customers were looking for, we ended up having to join multiple tables because of the normalized data set. We had to go and join multiple tables. And that actually also made it more difficult to get a predictable response time for our queries. Um, so these challenges made us to rethink how 
we solve this problem. So when we talked about, when we decided that, okay, we are going to take these challenges and we are going to solve this problem, we said, we need to think slightly different. What we are looking for is something that has to be processed in memory. And the way we did it is like, we kind of said, okay, we are going to have a data grid in, in our data centers and the data grid layer is going to be kept in sync with our primary data store, which is our SQL uh, or relational databases. And then all our search and query operations from the application layer is going to be going to the data grid, into the in-memory data grid, rather than going to our relational databases. So we'll go into a little bit more details into of what, the, what, the, what our data grid looks like and how we built it, but kind of give you a big picture. This is kind of the architecture that we put together. And this is, we are not unique in this, like most traditional systems have the same challenges because you, you probably, if you are a system that was like built before 2009 or 2010, you probably didn't have NoSQL you probably have a relational database of some kind. Now, obviously taking all those systems and then converting them completely into NoSQL probably may not be a small task. So you end up, but if you have to solve the performance challenges associated with those same applications, this is one way to think about how you might be able to solve. Um, so what is a data grid? What is the data grid that we put together? If you really think what we did is, it's really a distributed memory first modular centric system where the data is kept in memory across the data centers and replicated across data centers. So it is built on top of data store like Couchbase and search engine like Elasticsearch. And we could potentially add other types of data stores if we need to. The idea is, you're separating the, your application layer from your actual data store layer through an API layer provided by our data grid functionality so that it can provide the, both the storing as well as the query layer for the applications while managing how the data is kind of stored into the data store layer and how the query is performed. Um, so one of the challenges that we had was, while it's great when all the data is managed and changed through your application layers, if you have been part of any of the relational traditional systems, you know that like you're going to run some jobs, you're going to write some select queries, update queries, that is going to go and manipulate the data into the database directly, which did not go through your application layer. Now, what do you do with those changes? How do you make sure those changes now can be reflected in the queries and the reads that you are performing on the data grid layer? Now, in order to solve that challenge, we built our own sync service that incrementally syncs the data from, essentially from the relational database into the data grid layer. Um, so one thing that we ended up doing is like we had to kind of refactor some of our schemas to make sure that we can do that. One thing we had to do was like anytime you modify any data in our relational database table, we capture the time of modification so that we can be more efficient in terms of our sync service so that you can compute or identify which rows were changed during the last n minutes or x seconds so that you can continuously keep your sync service incrementally syncing the data from the relational database layer into, your, into our data, get, data grid cluster layer. Um, kind of going a little bit deeper into the architecture of how the data grid layer looks like, if you think about it, there's an application which is probably doing a kind of some kind of a create or an update operation. And that create and update operation then kind of goes into the couch base. So it goes into our API layer, which the data grid API layer, the data grid API layer then essentially translate that CRUD operation, the, the create and update operation into couch base. Once the couch base performs that operation, what it does is that through the, connect couch, the connector plugin, 
that is provided by Couchbase for Elasticsearch, the data gets synced into Elasticsearch. And this, any read operation, search operation, can then now be performed through the Elasticsearch APIs. Now, one thing to keep in here is that since it's two separate data stores and we have replication involved, there is always some kind of a delay in terms of how quickly that data is synced up. Now, we had to tune both the connector plugin for Elasticsearch as well as Elasticsearch itself to make sure that delay is as low as possible so that we can tolerate some kind of a delay in our application uh, in terms of the data being available to the application to read it back. And a lot of the times, if you're just looking for a key value lookup, you're probably fine because the key value lookup can go back to Couchbase. But if you're looking for queries, the queries has some delays. You just have to make sure that you understand what you're doing so that your application can deal with the eventual consistency associated with the connector. As well as Couchbase is providing the replication across data centers so that the application on a remote data center can query the data locally on the data center rather than having to reach across the data center. So this kind of gives us the active-active data center model where application can essentially do local, local reads and local updates, and the data will be eventually be consistent across both the data centers. Now, in terms of the lessons learned of rolling this out into production, one thing we'll make sure is that like, you have to automate your DevOps functionality. If you don't have setting up the cluster, bringing up the nodes, configuring replication, all of that automated, it's going to take you longer in the long run to deploy it and support it and maintain it. Our initial investments into automating this helped us to make sure that like as we started with Couchbase 2.0, went to 2.5, went to 3.1. We didn't spend a lot of time in terms of being able to set this up multiple times and test it out. So we built our own automation in terms of um, how we can test the whole functionality across two different clusters end to end. So with that, we were able to quickly roll out our functionality as we updated our version of Couchbase. So the, your solution in production is only as good as your monitoring. Make sure that when you deploy this into production, you have alerts and monitoring that are in place to support your production systems. Here are some of the metrics that we monitor at the node level, at the cluster level, as well as at the, pro, I mean, at the OS level, at the bucket level, to, to essentially to understand is our data grid cluster and system from, from Couchbase perspective working properly or not. Um, you may have, I mean, there are, I heard there are other sessions that talk more about monitoring and alerting, so you may want to get information from those sessions to make sure that it works, whatever you put together works really work, works well for you. But it's important that you have active alerts and monitoring system in place. Um, so some of the things we had to tune is really related to like how compaction works and also how, what, what kind of operations you want to do when you add and remove nodes, as well as making sure you have a plan for doing security updates for either for your OS or any other um, libraries or things that you're utilizing. I mean, we have done complete OS upgrades and security patches on our OS layer without even the application layer knowing that we did that for our entire cluster. We are able to kind of roll through the different instances of Couchbase and update them without the application even being touched, knowing that it is happening underneath at the Couchbase layer. Or, or even for the Elasticsearch layer. Now, what we are doing is that like, we are rolling this out, uh, a newer, newer version of our data pipeline based on Couchbase 
having Couchbase running on Mesos and Docker, as well as we are integrating Couchbase with Spark, and we are putting the in-memory layer using Alexio to speed up the performance. Um, here's a quick overview of our real-time pipeline, data pipeline layer. We have the data ingestion from the devices, sensors, and from cloud going into Kafka. Once it goes into Kafka, then we basically stream the data into Spark and have that Spark batch process that data and perform the operations that are in the middle, like analytics, rules, actions, and then store the processed data and the raw events into a data store like Couchbase, and then have the user be able to view the result set either from the data store, or if there are additional computation that is needed, then they can actually go to the Spark job layer and ask for the computation to be performed and the results said to be made available. Now, um, what I would like to do is to maybe have a quick demo um, of what we did to achieve this at 500 events per second, uh, as well as uh, Couchbase cluster being able to sustain about 3.5 million operations. So, Yifan, can you come over and maybe you can talk through the video? Okay. okay. This is the end. This is not right. Where's the file? Let me close it. Reopen it. Yeah, okay. Okay. Mm. Hello, everyone. Um, this is a Hi, um, PC. Hi, everyone. Um, that, uh, so I will um, um, go through quickly with the uh, one of our um, the POC we did in uh, Verizon Lab. Um, as Mohan mentioned, that uh, this is a uh, proof of concept on the, uh, the data streaming um, with uh, Spark and uh, uh, Couchbase. Uh, so what this particular data pipeline is doing is that to aggregate the device usage um, into Couchbase. So when the event come in with uh, device usage um, information, we aggregate the, the usage in the Spark cluster and then uh, save back into Couchbase. Um, as you can see here um, on the screen, that uh, uh, every the whole stack is deployed into um, a Mesos a cluster for easy um, deployment and a scale up and down. Um, so everything is dockerized into uh, containers. Um, the first uh, uh, cluster is actually a simulator that we generate the usage events uh, into Kafka. You can see that uh, there is five instances of them. Those are the usage simulator. And uh, coming back, um, then we have this um, Spark streaming job that's running. This is a single instance. Um, reading data from Kafka cluster and uh, submit the batch jobs into Spark cluster. So here is the uh, uh, couch base actually, uh, sorry. Um, so this is uh, the Spark master UI that's showing that uh, we have uh, um, 60 alive workers here. Um, and 240 cores in total. So basically the Spark workers that are actually um, receiving the, the, the batch, batch data from the Spark driver and then processing it. Here is the driver UI that you can see that the incoming 
event rate was stabilized at 500,000 per second. Um, then you see that uh, here um, down below, we have the processing time, processing time around the 15 seconds, but actually it's under six, 15 seconds. Uh, the 15 seconds is actually the batch window that we configured for, for the Spark job. And uh, so this is the, the, finally the Couchbase uh, um, UI showing that uh, the incoming traffic, um, the peak operation we can have is uh, between 3.5 and 4 million per second. Um, you will see those uh, huge peaks uh, from, uh, the periodically because of the, the nature of the Spark batching job. But, uh, what happens is that the, on every batch, the Spark will actually do a reduce on the key to get the distinct set of the device IDs and then retrieve those usage data from Couchbase. So you will see first a huge read peak and then they aggregate the usage into the memory and then write save back to the Couchbase. Then you see uh, the alternative read and write uh, um, the peaks in the, in the UI. So it's running pretty steady. Um, so here we can see that the, the disk queue and uh, actually the, the disk and the replication queue, they have no pressure at all because they can keep up with uh, the batch information. And uh, this is uh, DCP queue and uh, replication queue. So, yeah, here, this is the bucket. We have only one bucket with 100 million devices um, in the bucket. This is a list of the servers. We have 14 uh, nodes running in this POC um, in the Couchbase cluster. So, I guess uh, in general, that uh, the Couchbase cluster has been very stable uh, on, the, on the heavy load. And uh, of course, that. Uh, I, I think that there's a lot of optimization we can still do in further in, um, in, on the Spark side to actually um, get more um, throughput. Um, but, uh, but we believe that the Spark and together with the Couchbase, we can do a lot, a lot more in the okay. IoT. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Yifeng. Mm -hmm. sure. okay. So one thing we ended up doing is that we, we got the initial 500K per second from Spark and Couchbase, and we looked at a little bit of where the bottleneck is. So in order to, to speed up Spark, we added Alexio, which is an in-memory layer on top of Couchbase, so that Spark can essentially perform the co computation in memory. So to get extra, th we got like 50% additional throughput by layering Alexio as part of Spark. Um, so our next steps, we are looking at 4.5. So we, I mean, there are a lot of performance improvements in Nickel in 4.5. There is memory optimized indexes and integrated full text search, um, which may be solving some of the problems that we had earlier uh, with the original 4.0 version of, uh, of the queries as well as partial update and reads, which will be more optimized in terms of if you're updating only a very small portion of the document, you don't have to update the entire document. So those are the things that we are evaluating. Obviously, a Couchbase just announced their analytics solution, so we'll be looking at them. Um, thanks a lot for attending this presentation. Um, I think like we have uh, Steven, Abhishek, and Yifeng, and if you guys have any questions, we can probably take it now. So uh, two questions. First question has to do with your sync service. Yes. So the uh, curious to find out the uh, in your sync service, uh, what kind of the uh, mechanism you use? Are you uh, using the on demand or using a schedule, periodic batch refresh, and any other mechanism that you okay. use to synchronize between your 
uh, uh, SQL databases to Couchbase. Okay. Uh, let me trust. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that. Maybe we can go to this. So sync service is actually a, a kind of think of this as an like an incremental operation rather than like a batch operation. So it is continu running continuously. And we have a, like, let's say we have like 20 or 30 tables in our relational database system that we want to sync into Couchbase. So one thing that you have to think about it is, what we have is, we have these 20 or so tables got merged into one document associated with the device in Couchbase. So we ended up, what we ended up doing is that like these 20 tables get updated, changed, depending on the nature of the table at different intervals. Some of them are batch updates that come into those tables. Some of them are real-time tables that get updated in real time. And some of them are on demand by, and the customer updates them. So what we did is that for each table, we have a sync period interval that tells us that how frequently do we want to check for changes for that table and sync into Couchbase. So we had a service that we built, that is what we call as the sync service, that you basically set up what table, what configuration of, in terms of the duration, and what columns you want to read from that table and sync into Couchbase. And essentially, that service is going to, once it's configured, it's going to periodically read, look for those tables that you have configured and the columns and, the, and sync it with Couchbase. Okay, so it's a push from the SQL engine to the Couchbase. That's a push. It's a push. Yeah, push. It's, okay. it's basically a push and, into Couchbase. Right. And it's cross data center? Or is it so single data center? So we use Couchbase for our cross data center replication. Right. So you update it only in one data center and let Couchbase up push the change to so the other data center. So your sync service is only pushing to a one uh, couch cluster, Couchbase cluster in one data center. And exactly. And relying on the XDCR. Exactly. Uh, by direction replication between the yes. up to end. Okay. So to repeat the question, the question was, are we using sync service to update the data in only one data center and using XDCR from Couchbase to replicate the data across the data center? The answer is yes. Okay. So second question has to do with the use of the Alux Zero. So the, uh, I believe that the Couchbase already had built in main cache engine. So uh, why using the uh, additional memory, uh, you know, optimization, open source, Okay. which is, what, you know, what are the uh, reasons that you decide to do that? I'm going to defer to uh, Yifeng. I, I can give you a general answer, but he can probably give you a very specific answer for you. Yifeng, you want to take that question? <clears throat> so you want to repeat the question? Yeah, so the question is that uh, what's the purpose of using the Alexio? It seems that uh, Couchbase is already have that in-memory cache, right? So, so what we did uh, is that um, for for using purely using Couchbase, so what we have to do is for for that POC, uh, we have to read first from the Couchbase to get the accumulated usage for each device, and then accumulate with uh, the aggregate with the new incoming events and save it back to Couchbase. So we are trying to actually further increase uh, uh, the throughput. So what we want to do is that we save the read from Couchbase. So what we are going to do is that we actually accumulate the aggregated usage in memory only locally in the Spark workers. Right? So, so that uh, Spark has something called a stateful um, uh, accumulator or something like that. So we, we, we're using that, so which means that the incoming event no longer has to read from the, the Couchbase to, in order to do aggregation. We just aggregate in memory inside the work nodes and then save only the aggregated data to the Couchbase. So we don't no longer need to read, we only need to write to Couchbase. So we can double the, the, the throughput. But in order to do the in memory accumulation in Spark, we need a checkpoint. So this is where the Alexio is using that we, we don't want. Uh, Stephen, you have yeah. some. Um, so I'm going to ask more why we pick Alexio. Um, one of the things that's like, Luxo is a virtual digital storage, right? So if you look at the way that Mohan presented earlier, we have something what we call the data grid. So inside data grid, we have multiple database. It's not just Couchbase. You can have Hadoop. You can have like different kind of different database on top of that. So basically that like, um, you can actually have a single interface inside a Luxio 
can store the memory. They can use for multiple like Hadoop, uh, Google File System, that everything to, to a single interface for your memory. And also, you can you know Spark. It will be faster when you share the RDD. You know, like sometimes you don't have to process the RDD over and over again. So um, I think you probably, uh, I think the luxury is to be uh, the one of the thing that when I, we start now, we both say that the in the future the the memory will be really cheap. So they want to store much stuff into memory, and they have a single interface for a multiple storage system. So that's the reason why we actually we look into a luxury as well. Does this answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Any other? Okay. I was late, but uh, anyway, I have a uh, general question. Sure. How, how, how do you dis dis distribute uh, or partition between the uh, workloads uh, of uh, the core and edge? And do you have sort of, uh, in terms of your architecture, do you have sort of API gateway? So I assume right now, according to my understanding, that you are aggregate all of the data from the edge devices and uh, go back to the data center or, or, or cloud, and then you are processing there, or you are distributed between Azure and the core, as well as a third party API gateways? Um, I, I'll try to repeat the question to make sure I get it correctly. So you're asking if the data from the devices are stored in the middle at the edge gateway level and distributed across the edge gateways or it's sent to a yeah. central location. Yeah, how much workloads are being processed locally, you know, right. at the edge, and so, how, much, how much of data, how, what okay. are kind of rule of sum? You know? Okay, I, I'll give you my perspective. I don't know if that's really the question or answer you're asking for. So if, if you really think about the IoT process flow, a lot of the times, some of the processing can be done locally, either on the sensor, if the sensor is not capable of making some actions, it can be done on an edge device gateway that is close to the device, uh, close to the sensor. So typically the processing there are alerts and notification and conditions that you have set that you want to act on. For example, you may be collecting information about like temperature in a certain sensor. Now, most of the time, as long as the temperature is within that range, you really don't need to perform any actions or notify anyone. So what you do is you typically say, collect the data, process the data, but don't do anything other than monitoring the data locally. But let's say that the condition is somebody left the refrigerator open, and you need to notify someone, hey, the refrigerator is now open. You need to send somebody to close it. So if it is a home, Yes, it may not be a big deal, but if you have a like a, if you're an hospital where you where you are storing really valuable drugs in a refrigerator and somebody left the ref refrigerator door open for more than two minutes, every medicine in that refrigerator has to be thrown out. So that's some, a lot of the times that is a big problem for hospitals. So those cases, what happens is the monitoring can happen locally, but when a condition is reached or some kind of condition is, or trigger happens, then you need to communicate to the cloud, and then the cloud has to process that data or the event, and then take appropriate action like notifying someone that a certain condition has been met. I don't know if that I answered the question correctly uh, or not. Uh, in certain degree, you're right, but uh, that's really depends on, it's called industry by industry, use case by use case. Exactly. You know, probably in your domain, I, I guess that, 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 that's okay, but uh, look at HP, they are selling, it's called edge server. Think about that. Right, so, I mean, <laughs> yeah. so. But, uh, anyway, anyway, I understand. Now, I, I, roughly I know what kind of IoT architecture you, you are targeting. You know? Right. Thank you. Okay. All right, Th thanks a lot everyone. Thanks for attending the breakout session. <laughs>